essentially when Hashem made the world, he created these seven different channels. <clears throat> and each channel connects to another six. So essentially there's 49 different steps <clears throat> we go through, which is really connected to the Sturata Omet. So tonight is a combination of Yusot. We're now in the sits of the Svirot, very low down. So, you know, it's Chesed there on the right, Kibura on the left, Beres in the middle, Hod, like the right leg, um, sorry, Netzach, the right leg, Hod, <coughs> connected to HOD, and the left leg, then Yusot down the middle, and then Malchut. So tonight is a combination of Joseph <coughs> and Aaron and Hod. The topic I wanted to pick tonight, funny when I spoke to Rabbi Tatz, trying to understand, according like, to contemporary reality, how do we explain Hod and Netzah? And he goes, it's, it's, it's parents, it's grandparents, meaning when Hashem made the world, he wanted us to go through this, this, this spiritual reality that you have chesed, that then it moves and evolves downwards, and then it evolves again. So it just keeps moving down. It's a bit like you have a grandfather to the his son, and then the grandson, you have this continuation of spiritual growth. So I thought we haven't discussed a very important topic called honor your parents. And I want to try and make it a little bit Kabbalistic as well and understand the meaning of it. We'll also make it practical and contemporary and real as well. So we're really going to try with Hashem self tonight and go into the topic of Kabe de Sabicha Vesimecha, honoring your father and your mother. In fact, just beforehand, you were saying that a lot of people have a myth about it, a myth about honoring your parents. Maybe let's just actually start off with, just here, just from you, just for a moment. What do you, how do you view honoring your parents? Like, what does it mean for you, Dan? <coughs> Respect them, basically. Respect, yeah. okay. And, you know, no talking back, no arguing. Um, Sounds like my wife, okay, who else? Anyone else? Back. Um, How do you understand on your, on your parents? Uh, to to he, heed their advice, to listen to what they've got to say. Do you have to listen to them, whatever they tell you to do? No. Except break from the Let's say that they were to say, and we're going to speak about that practically a bit later, but just, I really don't like this fiance. You, I, I don't think it's good news. <laughs> I think you should break it off. Are you meant to break off? They say, and they say it says in the Bible, on your parents. Like, all of a sudden, they, you know, it's amazing how some parents, that's the one they'll quote. And the Torah says, it's in the Ten Commandments. They know it's in the Ten Commandments, right? It's in the Ten Commandments on, the, on your parents. I guess it's a um, combination of the bone system, the little certain bone system, which, um, what do you mean by headlines? They can be also a concept of forgiveness and love. Because So it's, it's a concept that that sort of concept between a value system and learning about how to love and take that forward and, and how we live our lives is is, 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 is sort of comes from our parents. Yeah. So we live our lives in the best way possible, the best value system, moral principles and standards by living our lives in that way, but on the, our parents. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it's not. And this is how some people view it. It's not. I feel guilty. This is what I've got to do. Feel it's not about that. It's not that you feel that you can't move forward and be an independent adult. Hashem wants you. Your parents should want you. There's nothing that gives me more joy when I see my children, no longer children, when I see my children making their own independent decisions and their own independent families. It's, it's a real misconception to feel that your parents should shackle you and you're almost like handcuffed, and you can't move on with your life. A parent should want you to move. In fact, we learned it from last week's Sedra. It says, Noah, is Elohim, is Halei Noah, but Noah, says Hashem walked with Noah. But Rashi compares it to Abraham, where it says, by Abraham, Abraham walked in front of Hashem. Explains Rashi, that's my greater. Because when you walk with, I mean, I was teaching my children, I taught my first son, Yitzi, to walk, and I'm holding his hand, holding his hand, and I let go and he falls down, he doesn't have the independent strength to walk. That's not the nachas I got. I didn't get nachas when he fell down. I got nachas when, that moment he let go and started walking by himself. 
having the independence to walk by himself. That's why Abraham's greater than Noah, because Abraham walked in front of Hashem. So the parent needs to try and be happy when their children kind of walk off into the sunset independently, but then yet Hashem says that there's this connection, and we're going to try and define what this connection is, and please God will speak some, some, some mysticism. Why did Hashem make that connection so important? So here we go. <clears throat> Honor your parents. Step number 40. It says in the Torah, there's two key verses. Anyone know what are the two key verses about honoring your parents in the Bible? Anyone know? Ten Commandments. What's the one? What does it say in the Ten Commandments? Honor thy mother and thy In mother. Hebrew? Kabet. Et avicha vetimecha. Et avicha vetimecha. And then what's the next one? The one in Leviticus. It says, Ish imo va'avid tira'u. That a man should fear his mother and his father. So let's put let's learn a bit of Gemara now. Are you ready? Can we do a bit of Talmud? We've got I know you're sitting comfortably, but I get that, right? That's why in Podovich they're not sitting on these couches, right? They're sitting on this little wooden chair and, and their back is there <coughs> because they need to be focused and they engross. So so now let's try and get you into a Podovich mindset. What the Gemara will do, it compares and contrasts those two verses. So let's do this again. On one hand, it says, Kabed es avicha vesimecha. The other possible it says, which again in English, you should respect your father and your mother. The next possible says, Ish, imai va'obid tiro. You should fear your mother and your father. What is the question that's meant to come? Come on, Anton. They switched them around. Mazel tov, someone's listening. What have we switched around? They first said the father and the mother, and then they said the mother and the father. Can I let Ryan go for Anton? That was quite a simple. That's because he's learning a simple from Nefer Shachai. Ryan got into him to, to, to get into that. So, awesome, that's what the Gemara asked. Like Hashem like, made a mistake in telling Moshe the information. You know, the first line he says, father and mother, and then he says, mother and father. Any ideas why? Come on now, for real, for real now. Now you've got to take the Talmud's answer. What is the reason why we switched, we switched it around? Come on in, I think. So it's, it's pretty obvious, it's pretty intuitive. It's coming to teach you, it's always like the, the thumbs get out, right? It's coming to teach you something. What's it coming to teach you? Respect them both the same. So the what we said then be, be the same. Just keep it, you know, father and mother. So the first one is honor, the other one is fear. Yes. So honor, they put the father first, but fear they put the mother first. Correct. So why? So, so, so to uh, teach you that. Yeah, Jewish, Jewish mother. You know, you know, always, always be afraid of your mother. No, 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 no. But, but, but let's think. Well, what's the difference between uh, honor and fear? Um, so, you know, one is perhaps um, a positive, one is a negative Good. feeling. You're getting so close, but no cigars, you say. Okay. So I can't give you the prize yet. Um, you can finish it off. It's to teach you a lesson. It's to teach you something that, if not, it would be this order, you wouldn't have known. The following. And kabeid is referring to the loving side, the respecting side of what you do for them. So we'll see soon, you've got to feed them, and clothe them, and, and, and house them, and make sure the heating's working for them, and, and making sure they can get from A to B and do the shopping, that's the kabeid. The, the tira'u, the fearing, which doesn't mean fear from a very scared perspective, it means awesomeness. In fact, Ruth Cook says the word fear comes from the word see. You really see each other, and you have total view, and you see the, the awesomeness of your parents and how much you owe them, and therefore, God forbid, don't contradict them. You're not meant to sit in their chair. You're not meant to um, call them by their first name. It's what you, you don't do. So like this, the way generally it works is generally, and again, I'm sorry if there's exceptions in this room, there's always exceptions, but I think the majority of the time it says, this was written two and a half thousand years ago, and that majority I still believe exists. It's more natural to have a more cuddly, more, um, perhaps a loving relationship with your mom and a more respectful, a little bit more of a fair relationship with your father. So the Torah switches it to say, you might have thought that naturally, fear your dad and love your mom. But actually, you've got to work on yourself to do the opposite as well. So Kabe, the loving, first of all, your father. Because it's trying to get you to cut out your comfort zone. 
you know, give your dad a hug as well. And your mom, be, 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 have that awesomeness for her. Don't just be, oh, it's mom, it's mom. You know, she, she's happy whatever I get up to. That's, a, that's not a healthy perspective. The perspective is to, to fear your mom and love your dad as well as the reverse. And that's what the Torah classically does. It, it will often emphasize that which doesn't come naturally to teach you to, to, to balance that. Does that work for you, for you guys? For, like, for you, is that how, how it's worked? That, that your dad is more, and your mom is much more kind of more cuddly and more easier and a more kind of uh, easier relationship? Or is that, you're not sure? Some yes, exactly some no. Yes, yeah. 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 I don't think my kids will say that. My <laughs> kids will say that I'm the more cuddly and my, my wife's right. the more So for you, for you, you, but for you yourself, your parents, yeah. it was that. And I think three out of four, or two out of three, will be that. And there's, there's, of course, there's exceptions. Of course there's exceptions. So that's where it begins. Now let's start talking about why. Because I'm very into the whys. Before we get into the specifics of how to honor your parents, why did Hashem do it this way? What is the meaning behind honor your parents? So there's a very, any ideas? You spoke to a few, anyone else wants to suggest something? Um, is it a little bit to do with your relationship with God as well? It is. Um, you know, we we look to our parents as the source of life and and, and you know our our ability to be alive and, and they've nurtured us and brought us into the world and that's a similar kind of relationship between ourselves and, and God. Love that. Anyone else want to add, Richard? Well, well, why? Well, what's, what what are you meant to gain from one of your parents? What lessons are you meant to learn from that? Why does God make it part of the Ten Commandments? Do you know the Ten Commandments, according to Rasad Yaban, are the essential 613 mitzvot. All 613 mitzvot are rooted in the Ten Commandments. So it's a huge one. It's a macro mitzvah. There's micro mitzvahs and macro mitzvahs. It's a macro mitzvah. So why is it? So I'll start with a very famous sefer called the Sefer Achinuch. And the Sefer Achinuch explains it's very much about what we call in Hebrew, hakarat hatov. Which name is just gratitude. So that gratitude. So that gratitude. We can either, my friends, be choosers and beings of gratitude or choosers and beings of ingratitude. It is up to us which ones we are in there. Your parents are a litmus test. But are you someone who embodies gratitude or not? Let's explain. There's a halacha that if you have a step parent, do you still need to do kibbutz for M for your step parent? What do you think? Yes or no? No. They didn't biologically bring you into this world. But you absolutely still have to do the mitzvah. You have to do the mitzvah for if you were adopted. If you were fostered, there's a mitzvah. <coughs> Why? Well, explains the Sefer Akinah. Because the mitzvah is not solely because they brought you into the world. You could argue that's the easy part. In fact, that is the easy part. The hard part is to bring you up. You know, only someone who's really had kids can know how much effort. And, you know, I always said my life didn't change when I got married. My life changed when I had kids. All of a sudden, you don't have your own life anymore, especially those first few years. You know, because there's a little baby <coughs> absolutely reliant on you. Reliant on you. How they, you know, to sleep, to eat, to be wiped. I tell you something that makes me, it's very fascinating. The way Hashem does it is initially the parent gives selflessly to the child, to the baby. How many times in the end that baby has to do the very same actions back to the parents? Feed, help them put them to sleep, even wipe. Nowadays everyone's getting carers. But some people don't get carers. So some, some, some children are happy to go all in and, and be the carer for the parents. It's not just a coincidence, it's not just karma, it's hashkachah pratit, it's exactly the way it's meant to be. It's, it's someone does you a favor, you do them back a favor. And ideally the very same favor, because that shows gratitude. It's an amazing story I heard from one of my friends in, in Ostermeth, Rabbi Kaplan. This is a beautiful story, very chilling story happens in London. 
in, in Golders Green, there was a um, some kids who were, who were going to bed. All of a sudden, there's this rat that's running around the room. And you, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a Jewish thing. We struggle with animals often. Because, you know, my family, Gary, they freak out with spiders. You know, rats isn't a good one. It's interesting because there was a rat in my supper this year and I had to keep it quiet from everyone because I knew if I'd say a word, everyone would freak out. My, my, my kids would never come back in it. I just saw it in the middle of the night one night. It's like, okay, better keep this quiet. Right, I'm sure, I'm sure it left. But, so this rat came in and the children were petrified and they got like, how dare this rat? And they, but they were kind of like quite adventurous and they managed to trap the rat. And they were working out now, how can we exterminate this rat? And he rats them. And the grandfather walked in and heard the commotion. So what are you doing? And he saw the rat in the corner. They trapped him, they were about to kill him. The grandfather says, leave the rat alone. Don't touch it. Let it free. And they said, like, okay. What do we like? You love rats all of a sudden? This is what the grandfather said. I was in Auschwitz. And in our barracks, there were times in the winter where not all of us had a bed. Some of us actually had to be on the floor. There were times I had to sleep on the floor and we didn't have blankets. And we're freezing in the corner. And often he said the rats who were also freezing would come and we'd be hugging each other and making each other warm and helping each other through the night. The rats helped me survive Auschwitz you're not touching a rat. Deep story. That's gratitude. Where do we see in the Torah? Anyone know a similar story to that in the Torah? With Moshe Rabbeinu? Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron to bring the plot of the, the plague, the ten plagues of blood. What do you need to do? Hit the water. Moshe Rabbeinu, I can't hit the water. Yeah, the God's been saying to Hashem. And you're hitting the water to make a huge kinesh Hashem so that the world sees the might of Hashem. And Moses doesn't know why. Why couldn't he hit the water? Because it saved him when he was a baby. Because it saved him when he was a baby. When he was a baby, and the, the Egyptians were out to kill him, and they quickly put his, the casket on the Nile when he was on the Nile. And that the water saved his life. He's not touching the water. A few plagues later, he had to hit the, the dust. For the plague of lies, I can't touch the dust. Why not? Anyone know? How did the dust save him? Because when he had to fight with an Egyptian, an Egyptian taskmaster was trying to kill one of the Jews, and he had to kill the Egyptian with Hashem's name, by the way. That's how he kills him. He used one of Hashem's names. And he fell down and he hid him under the dust, which saved Moshe Rabbeinu from being killed, because everyone came out to look for the commotion. The dust saved Moshe Rabbeinu's life. I can't touch the earth now. Now let's try and understand this. That's where the famous line, don't spit from the well that you've drunk, comes from. Which is really deep. Which means, if even an inanimate object or a rat has helped you for the rest of your entirety, if you're someone of gratitude, you're not going to hurt the rat. You're not going to hurt that object, that, that, that item, which saved you because you're someone who values gratitude. Because that's who you are as a person. That's who you are as a soul. And therefore, now we start understanding if your parents, who, who've been there selflessly, you, you literally would not be sitting here tonight if not for your parents. Would you agree with that statement? Sometimes people make statements like that. This is that is not an overstatement. But not only that, so many of your gifts, so many of your qualities, so many of your privileges, so many of your successes in life you would not have had without your parents. So every time you encounter your parents, this is an opportunity for either gratitude or ingratitude. Up to you. Are you grateful or ungrateful? <coughs> Who are you going to be? And that's why sometimes when they ask you to do something, or it's a little bit inconvenient, or it's not easy, great! You say, Hashem, thank you so much for now giving me a great mitzvah. Because that's when it's a mitzvah, right? It's not a mitzvah when it's, hey, that's so easy. You know, I'm taking my mom to Novelino Wednesday. That's not the biggest mitzvah. I like going to Novelino. Do you know what I mean? 
but you know, to go and when I've taken the two vaccines and now it's a bark and da da da, hey, that's a little bit more. When it's when it's a little bit more inconvenient, that's when it's a bigger mitzvah. Why? Because that's your opportunity to either express gratitude and to be someone who has appreciation. And by the way, it's an amazing litmus test because if you are appreciative of your parents, then you'll start being appreciative of other people. You're appreciative of your friends that have helped you, your spouse. You know, in, in business, we're living in such a cutthroat business world where someone really is there for you and has been there for you. There are times that they're ignored when they need help. You have an opportunity to help them back and you're like, you turn your back. That's because we're living in a, in a world of ingratitude. As someone who excels in honoring their parents, I would hope they will also now excel in, in being kind to people that help them in business. Being kind to people that help them full stop. Because now you're someone who expresses kindness, expresses giving back. So the first concept is, is very much gratitude. That's one idea, so it's a fresh enough to give it up a second. It's a bit of a, a, a deeper one. Your parents were a link in the chain of the Jewish people. <coughs> Between Abraham Avinu, this week's century, who started with Abraham Avinu, the founder of Judaism, the father of Judaism, Av, Raham, means the father. Between you and Abraham, they are that link in the chain. And what's really interesting, we believe in something called Yuridat Hadorot. You know what that means? It means descent of the generations. It means descent of the generations. And it's counterintuitive and it's the opposite of how society views itself. Society views itself as progressives. And every year we're progressive, getting more advanced. From a spiritual perspective, we don't look at it that way. Let me start with a story. The famous story of one of the big tzaddikim called Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the leaders of American Jewry. It's a cool story. He's sitting on a plane. And the way Hashem does it, I don't know if you ever know, even when you're sitting on a plane, who, who you sit next to. That's from Providence. It's not random. Even, they used to say randomly, they're putting people together. You know, if you're someone who's involved spiritually, nothing's random. Definitely, you sit next to one of the famous and random. So Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky Hashem had it that the airlines put him next to a famous professor of biology in Baradon University, a renowned atheist, a renowned believer in Darwin's theory, and they spoke a little bit. The Rabbi Yaakov is a big tzaddik. He was just trying to learn Torah. He was, you know, he was had all his gemaras with him. He was focused. Anyway, half an hour later, Yaakov Kamenetsky's son comes over to 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 Yaakov. Are you okay? Does anything I can get you? I can look after you. Ten minutes later, his grandson comes to, you know, Zeta, Are you okay? Can I get you some drinks, some water? The whole way through the fight. His children, his grandchildren kept coming to him, looking after him, having a little chat with him. At the end of the fight, before they, they got off, the professor of biology said to Rav Kamenetsky, I just, there's one thing I just don't get. Your kids have literally been trying to like serve you the whole way through the fight. He said, to be fair, my kids have been watching a movie. They haven't even said hi once. They're not interested in me one jot. What is so different between you and me? So we have to come in next week. Okay, this is the chance now to have my little debate about God. This was his moment. So we have to come in next week, said in his genius to him, tell me the main difference between you and me. You believe that we come from chimpanzees. So your children look at you is you're one step closer to a chimpanzee. We teach that we come from Moshe Rabbeinu. We come from Avram Rabbeinu. So we're our parents, grandparents are one step closer to greatness. We're not one step closer to a chimp. We're one step closer to Moshe Rabbeinu. The very deep idea. Which essentially is saying the following. Since we come from Again, even if we believe that Hashem created the world using certain evolutionary techniques, what we call macroevolution, 
Right, Hashem did a big, you know, Hashem made the world, even if you want to say there was Big Bang and Evolution, where we disagree with Darwin, where we disagree with certain biologists, we absolutely say we do not come from chimpanzees. Yes, we might have 97% DNA similarity, but it's 97%. And that 3% is very important. And we believe in the Torah's account that when it came to Homo sapiens, like, what happened before Adam and Eve? It could have well been, been a, this combination of, of man, animal, <coughs> caveman, whatever you want to call it. But we, Homo sapiens, us with a physicality, with a soul of Hashem within us, we come from Odom. Odom. Very important three letters we're going to speak about. Odom. Which comes from initially Adama, from the ground. But then the Chedek and the out, part of the Aleph of Hashem in us. We are this fusion of physicality and spirituality. <coughs> Human beings did not, we believe, evolve from animals. We started from Adam and Eve, and then evolved from there. Or should I say devolved? Because Adam and Eve are the highest of the highest. The mystics explain Adam and Eve in the garden could see everything. They could see us. They saw the whole future. They weren't bound by time and space to an extent. They were vessels with light. And then when they sinned, okay, things started going a bit downwards from there. And then from Avram Avinu, he was a prophet. He was able to work out the 613 mitzvot. Do you know that? Avram Avinu put on spin. Do you know that? Abraham kept Shabbat. Abraham kept kosher. The Talmud says he kept everything. He even kept rabbinics. Why? Because he was a spiritual giant who, like an architect, could come into this room now and look at the, it says the Marana Prague, could look at this building and be able to work out the genetic blueprint, the sketch from the building. So Abraham was able to look at the world and understand what the sketch was. The Zohar says, Yisakel bo'eraiso bora alma. Hashem, first of all, built the Torah and then created the world as an output of that. This is the projection. The Torah is the projector. Abraham was so spiritually in tune, he was able, Richard, to understand that the Torah is the root. He's able to feel out Shabbos. He felt it was different on a Friday night. He's like, whoa, no malacha. He felt Rosh Hashanah. He felt Yom Kippur. And then, by getting prophecy, then he put everything together with Hashem's help. But there was an initial, when he was three years old, he was walking on the beach, working out spirituality. You know, when we're three-year-olds walking on the beach, we're building sandcastles if we're lucky. <coughs> Meaning that that was the highest of the high. So we believe in this following principle. The further we get from Sinai, spiritually we're lower and lower. We're like on the floor. According to Kabbalah, we're like at the, the bottom of the barrel right now. You know, it's the Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't get greater. Hashem speaks it, he was able to survive 40 days and nights without food and drink and, and receive transmission of the Torah. doesn't get better. And then the generation of the desert were the highest, called the Dur of Deya. They were receiving manna from heaven, the clouds of glory. As then we went into Israel, it was the golden era of the Jewish people for, the, for going into Israel. King David, King Solomon, that first temple. The second temple, with those who just about lived during the second temple would cry when they saw the second temple, when they remembered what the first temple was. Because the first place I mean, was so much more regal, majestic, beautiful, spiritual than the second temple. Now we can only imagine what the second temple is. You understand how we start descending like a slide. We're descending from that height of <coughs> spiritual greatness. We just start descending. You know, they get, can you only imagine these Tanaim Amaraim, the people who wrote the mission in the Talmud? Hillel, the greatness of Hillel, he, was, he used to... You know, at the beginning of Hillel's greatness, when he was very poor, he was literally on the windows. Imagine this was windows. He would be, they would find up, they would wake up in the morning, they would see him stuck to the windows because he would climb to the top of the windows to hear the Torah being learned. There's no one up here tonight. Or if there is, you know, we need to find out about it, right? There shouldn't be. Because, because that concept of what we call mysterious nefesh for Torah. So every generation we're getting lower and lower and lower. So your parents are one step closer to Moshe Rabbeinu, one step closer to Hashem. So you're part of that incredible link. That's one of the core reasons. Yes? I've got a question. I sure. say that, but when you have children, is it correct that your children are further from Hashem than you are? Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. Mm. But I'll give you a bit of an Arizal twist, because like, there's always a twist. Then says that Arizal, and hopefully this can make you feel a little bit better if you're feeling round the floor and it's not feeling like 
you're very similar to the rat in the story we had earlier. There's one bit of good news, says Darita, which is called the Thumsara Agra, according to the effort is a reward. Meaning, Hashem looks at you and your achievements based on the reality of the situation. So right now, those holy souls of you that have come tonight on a Monday night, Steve, in a pandemic, and you slept all the way to Hartsborn Golf Club, when you could have been so, you could be on Netflix now, you'd be going out on, you know, some, some dating apps tonight, or whatever, and instead, you have chosen to come and know Torah in the year Tosh Shin Pei Base, 5782, so far away from Moshe Rabbeinu, you actually get a greater reward than any time ever in Jewish history is at this time. So you should feel tremendous and wanting to walk out of here feeling 10 feet tall. Because now it counts more than ever because it's so hard. Why do you think so many people are turning away from, from religion, from spirituality? Do you think we've ever had anything like this before where one out of two Jews are marrying out? You know, do you think in Moshe Rabbeinu's time they had that? <coughs> in the Mishnah's time? In the Talmud's time? Never! Then now it's worse than ever because it's getting harder and harder. There's less of the overtness of Hashem in the world. Spiritualism is more and more hidden. But you know, materialism is more and more out there. Ego is more and more out there. Remember, ego stands for edging God out. So, so the more there's ego, the more it's edging God out. It's harder and harder. Says that result that when you achieve it, when you succeed, it's greater than any time ever. Because the fun Sarah I cross, you should feel good about yourself. On the other hand, we have to look at our parents. And by the way, that's the same thing if you see someone elderly. You know, I think certain cultures have even like culled the elderly. But in Judaism, we have to say anyone who's older, they have more wisdom, they have more experience, they're closer to truth. So you stand up for them on a bus, you stand up for them in a train, you stand up for them, you, you help them with their shopping. We, it, it should be innate to have respect for the elderly, especially those elderly or parents. That's what a Jewish value is meant to teach us. So that's the other idea of transmission. But then there's this final idea, which is what Anton was speaking about, which the Talmud says, and we'll get to the words Odom in a second, that the Talmud says there are three partners in your creation. So I said, you wouldn't be here if not for your parents, and not for God. It's a partnership between, you know, when, I think when Lady Diana said there was three in our marriage, right? So, so there's three in all of our parents' marriages, just not Camilla, right? The third one is, instead of Camilla, it's Hashem. <laughs> Right? Hashem is the third in, 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 in the marriages. It's God, who is the creator, who is the putting everything together. And then your parents, it's that combination. And therefore, and this is now deep, the way you honor your parents is a mirror image and a litmus test of truly how you honor Hashem. If you have appreciate for your appreciation for your creators, you have a creation appreciation for your creator. In fact, I heard from Zamei Cohen just now that I was just doing a bit of research. It says even the, the three letters of Adam, according to Kabbalah, the Aleph stands for the one of Hashem. So we are called Adams, we're humans. Aleph is Hashem, the Dalit Mem, Dam, which means blood, interestingly enough, has the numerical value of 44. Why is that relevant? What's the numerical value of Av, anyone? Aleph Vet, that's the easiest gematria of all time. Three. Three. Aim, mother. Aleph is one, name is 40. So come on, what's a father and mother in numerical value together? Four. 44. So Odom, which actually comes to 45, is Hashem and your parents. We are all an extension, a product of Hashem and our parents. And therefore, and this is critical now, Next time you have interaction with your parents, and by the way, for those like myself, who, who, who uh, and now my, my, it's the first time I've given a talk here without my father in this world. You know, it's one of the things that changed in the past year and a half for many, for many of us. This pandemic has, uh, has changed a lot. And one of the things that's changed is my dad is no longer in this world. So please God, tonight's talk can also be the Aliyah, the Shamash, the elevation, and the Shama of, of, of my father, the Kohen of the Bracha. And 
we can still do kibbutz of our aim for our parents when they're no longer here. You know that. Only, only your parents doesn't stop at the burial. You know, this Shabbat was my father's mother's yacht site, so I had the merit of being able to say Kaddish, like my father has been saying Kaddish for many years, for his mom, and I was now able to say Kaddish for his mom. So that was the fulfillment of Kibbutz of the Ever Any time I'm looking after my mom, not only am I looking after my mom, my, my dad's last words to all of us was, smother mommy. Right? So very much every time we do an act for a parent that's no longer here, it's still the mitzvah of Kibbutz of the So every time you have an interaction with your parent, every time you do an act of Kibbutz of the it's also a Kibbutz for Hashem. Because they are an essentially a, a partner of God. And they're really there to be a litmus test and to see, are you someone who has appreciation for your creator? In other words, and this is now critical, many people have issues with their parents. That's why psychologists, psychiatrists, Anton's wife are very successful. Because there's a lot of people who have got very messed up relationships with parents. And Freud would talk a lot a lot about how so much of what goes wrong is based on those relationships with our parents. And there's some bit of truth to that. And a lot of people struggle with this bit stuff. But if you start viewing your parents not just as the causes of all your tragedy and, and, and pain in life and trauma in life, but you start looking at your parents like a little bit of an estrogen. Like two, you're to fill in. It's filling. You've got the hands in, fill in, and the heads fill in. The safer Torah, the safer Torah comes in the room. You stand up and you give it a kiss. You know what? There's a halacha. I'd like you to try and see if you can achieve it. Every time your parents walk in, you're meant to stand up. They're like a safer Torah. Your parents aren't some annoying, nagging, abusive, elderly person that's driving you mad. If you view them that way, You've got a problem. Even if it was true. Even if that all that was true, that they're still a sacred Torah. Because Hashem has made them what's called a chetzer shal mitzvah. An objective mitzvah. You should know the Ashkenazim. This is from, so you sure it's going to be harder for the, the, the Naz, but for us, Ashkenazim, we're a bit more the Ramon from Moshe Ishli says you don't have to stand up every time they walk in the room. Once in the morning and once at night. It's far different every time. No mucking about. It's in passport. They walk in, you stand up. Now, it's really interesting, because many of you will say, well, if I start standing up and my parents walk in, they'll think like I'm ill, they'll feel like something's going wrong, they're like, where, where are you off to? So here's the thing. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Now, it's quite interesting in halacha. Do you think a parent can forego their honor? Can a parent say, Understand that. Can a parent you can sit in my chair? Can a parent call me by my first name? You don't have to worry about me, I'm, I'm good. Just... And by the way, we're living in today's culture where you have this like adult to adult relationship. You know, part of the, the messed up regression of society is they think it's cool and kind of woke to be able to call your parents by their first name. Because like we're all equal. You know, I want to call my dad John. Hey, John, you know, because then we're kind of, we're in this world of equality. So what happens if your dad says, no problem, call, I want you to call me John, because I want to be mates. And have banter with you. What's the the halakha is? Any ideas? Time for you to think now. What do you reckon? Yeah. You'd be disrespecting your father or your parent if you didn't abide uh, by what they've asked you to do. So you should call him John? You're going to call him John. Any, 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 Anton's not, not sure. So, I say no. So here's the thing. This is a very important point. It's something you sure mentioned at the beginning. And I've had this, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> She's not watching, so she won't remember. One of my story, one of my students many years back, got some really strange Kibbutz of Aim stories. I don't know how like, rabbis managed to find these stories, but Tell you three mad stories, like one of them <coughs> doesn't make sense, never mind, three of them happened to me. Right? So this is the first story. Girl from Canada. She's, she comes to London, she gets a bit more spiritual, she gets a bit more, she wants to stop keeping more of the Torah, she goes she wants to keep kosher, she goes back to Canada. Her parents are like, mm, you're, you're like this nonsense. Really? 
going back to the old ages, like Taliban style, you want to start eating kosher. I've never had such nonsense in my life. It says, honor your parents, that's the one you should keep. You know, we don't let you eat kosher. She's like, the rabbi warned me this might happen. So they said to her, you're going to come and see our rabbi. He's going to talk to you. So they came from a conservative background. And she's literally taken to the rabbi. It's very bizarre. And this conservative rabbi in Canada does something which A is totally wrong. He says, he put, she sat down on the chair. He locked the room, which you're not allowed to do that, right? Because uh, that's called yichut. You can't lock a room be alone in a room with a girl. And he said, you're not leaving this room until you get this nonsense out of your head. So she said to him, I get it about my parents. I get it that my parents would tell me, because like, you're the rabbi! Are you joking? Like, really? What are you a rabbi for if you don't believe a word of it? And this rabbi said to her, which I'll take the word rabbi a little bit um, suspiciously, said to her, you don't actually believe it's true, do you? So she said, but what do you mean? You're the rabbi. It's a powerful myth. So he was of the view that the whole Torah was one powerful myth. You can keep what you want and don't keep what you want, but basically... But the halacha is, it says in the Gemara Kiddushin, the following, if your parents tell you to do a sin, there is no mitzvah to honor them at that point. And the Torah qualifies it because it says you should honor your parents. Why? Because you love Hashem. It qualifies it. Or you, you fear Hashem, you love Hashem. It, it's a qualification in the verse. So therefore, if, you're, if your parents ask you to do a sin, there is zero Obligation. So if your parents ask you to call them by their first name, you, one, is, one is not meant to, according to Halakha, call them by their first name. I'll give you now a second more crazy story, and then third, which is the craziest. Second crazy story, I had a student of mine from this neck of the woods again, I hope he's not watching. He says, Rabbi, I need, I, need, I need some help. I said, I know you do, but like, what exactly would you like, which area of the many areas of help that you need would you like me to try and waste my time with? So he said, he said that, that I'm, I'm in court and I need like a character reference to, to the judge. And I said, I'm not surprised. Okay, what, 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 what's happened? He goes, very simple. My father begged me to go into the family business. Said, it says in the Bible, one of your parents would be in the family business. So I said, that, you know, kind of illegal and unethical what you're doing. He was running a brothel, the father. And, and the father said, you know, but, you know one of your parents. So the guy was Nick because he was, you know, continuing the business of his dad, <laughs> running that brothel, and, and he wanted me to come <laughs> and be a character reference. Can you imagine? I tell you, I can't believe I get into such, you know. So my wife is like, there is no way you are going to that court and start, like, defending him. They'll be in the paper, you know, Rabbi defends brothel owner. <laughs> you know, and I do not need the rabbi and brothel to be associated to me. So, so I had to unfortunately politely decline and say, well, I could tell them. He was so wrong in so many areas, but in the first place, your parents tell you, hey, let's go in the family business. I'm like a mafia leader. I mean, I kill people. Let's do it together. It's also, it's forbidden. And therefore, how many of my students have said to me, rabbi, you know, I'm now keeping Shabbat, and my parents say, whoa, you know, you do what you want, but when we go to grandmother, you're coming with, and you're getting in the car, and it says on your parents, mm -mm. Mm -mm. There, there is no mitzvah to honor your parents if they're asking you also to break the Torah. So that's very easy. Everyone got that clear? There's no mitzvah to honor your parents when they're breaking the Torah. Now, by the way, there's a difference between the kavod and the morat in Tanakha. When it comes to the kavod part of what you need to do, so your parents can say to you, you know, you don't have to stand up for me. They can say that. The thing, the kavod is what you do. You know, if you don't have to feed them if they're being fed. If they say, I'm good, I'm fine. You don't have to serve me. You know, there are times when you're actually meant to go and serve your parents if you're eating with your parents. And by the way, we're living in such a messed up culture. How many of you have been served by your parents? Messed up. And it's... Let me do it, it makes me feel good. It's so messed up, we're living in this world of lies. You say, mommy, daddy, you sit down, let me look after you. That's our job, to look after them, to serve them, to feed them, not the other way around, but whatever. But when it comes to what you're not allowed to do, like sitting in your dad's chair, you shouldn't be sitting in, even if he says, don't worry about it, we should say, no, I'm good. Calling by the first name, definitely hitting them, you're not allowed to hit them, you're not allowed to curse them, even if they say, I don't mind, 
You know, I'll swear at you, you swear at me. Mm -mm. You know, we're living in a culture, as I said, that we shouldn't go down to that level. We need to stay above and view our parents as what we call chetz hashem mitzvahs, like, like the Sefer Torah, like your tefillin. Next, the Baal Shem Tov said, oh, third story, even more bonkers. We couldn't get more bonkers than the proper one, but there's this top tit, right? Again, I hope he's not watching. This guy just said to me, he said to me, Rabbi, do I still have a mitzvah to honor my dad? I said, okay, why not? He killed my mom. True story. Happened in, in North London. He killed his mom and was in prison. And the boy refused to come and see him. And the, boy, and the father was saying, Go on to your father! So I'm gonna come, he's still my son! Come and see me! <coughs> That's heavy, no? That's heavy. So, the, so there's no. This, so that's very interesting. Because if. I started, I'm gonna give you another scenario. Let's say your parents, maybe you weren't the best parents, maybe you were a little bit abusive, they're a bit harsh on you, a lot of psychiatrists or psychologists salaries were paid because of how they messed up certain times in, in their parenting, you still have a mitzvah to honor them. You don't have a mitzvah necessarily to spend so much time with them and to be constantly abused by them, but there's still a mitzvah always to honor your parents, unless they move to what we call the realms of a rasha. If, God forbid, they become murderers, they become someone who's defined in the Talmud as a rasha, then at that point, you're no longer oblig obligated to honor them. And very much that was an easy one of killing your mom. That's kind of pretty, uh, that's where we draw the line, right? There was no mitzvah for him to have to go. That's where you could, God forbid, you know, the umbilical cords could, could have been, was cut, was cut. It's interesting, if they did shiva, they repented, I don't know the story now. Maybe the father's remorseful, repented, maybe they've got a relationship again, I don't know. But at that point, the guy, the father hadn't really, um, wasn't remorseful, I haven't to show up. But this brings me to this really important point now, which I'm hoping is gonna maybe give you a little bit of comfort. Because as I said, parents can never get it right. You know, if they're too nice, you spoil them. If they're too harsh, you ruin them. Really hard, really hard. They've got four kids. Me and my wife made so many mistakes. So many, I get so hard, so hard. I had to get that balance right. So whatever you do, your parents are going to be angry with you at the end. The, the kids are going to say, you messed me up. And so here's the thing. If any of us have had scenarios where we have some grievances with our parents, we, we've had tough times with them, we've been through some pain, says the Baal Shem Tov, and this is critical, listen to this. It's not that your parents choose you, that your neshama chooses your parents. What would you like to go mystical? Here we go. It's not just random, you've ended up with your parents, who are your parents. It's exactly what your soul needed to achieve its tikkun. We all have a certain role in life. We all have a certain spiritual potential to achieve. We need our parents to help us achieve that for all their strengths and faults. So if any of us have had a parent who's very, very critical, for example, that's what your neshama needed to develop a thick skin or to develop that strength or to develop that pain to enable you to grow and be the person you're going to be. And it could have been to do with previous lives, you believe in previous lives. But the, basically your parents' successes and failures were prescribed by Hashem. It's not random. And therefore you can let go of some of the resentment. You can get let go of some of the anger. Because it needs it to be. That was Bashet. You know, we've spoken about the idea that yes, we have on free will on one hand, but on the other hand, Hashem's running the show. So maybe your parents had free will the way you parented you, but for you to receive parenting, which was maybe a bit cruel, or maybe too spoiling you, whatever the good English word for that is, that's exactly what Hashem wanted you to receive, to develop you to allow you to climb your Mount Everest, to allow you to, to climb. Therefore, you can let go of some of the resentment. You know, I had one of my students Facebook me last week to say, you know, we have a very, very difficult relationship with my parents, very, very difficult. They're always critical. 
they would make me feel terrible. I never do, do I, you know, what do, what do I do? So I was trying to explain this idea of the number one, that's what Hashem wanted, that's part of your growth. So don't take it personally, one. Two, you still have a mitzvah to keep it up aim. But three, you don't necessarily have to be a doormat. You don't have to necessarily put yourself in a traumatic situation. Right? You're allowed to, you know, create some space. You know, you don't have to be with them 24-7. You don't have to be with them every Shabbos meal. You can be independent and you can move forward in your own life, but always still have that respect. And if your parents ever needed help financially with being fed, being dressed, being clothed, being housed, you absolutely have that obligation to do that. And if your parents say something untrue, even about you, you're not allowed to contradict. Do you know that? Now that Richard is a halacha, we're not allowed to contradict our parents. If your parents would say, the capital of France is Monaco, you can't say, uh, Paris, you can't say that. You can't say that. You've got to leave it. Why? Because life isn't about getting winning an argument. Life's about a bigger picture of honoring your parents and, and not contradicting them in private or public. Amazing, even if they're wrong, they're right. You know, when your parents say, I'm always right, they're actually right about that. You're not allowed to contradict. Now back to the question, if they would ask you to do something and to marry a different girl, you know, let's say there's these two girls. You know, there's, <coughs> there's, there's, there's Rachel and Leah. Let's be from, right? There's Rachel and Leah, right? You like Rachel and you like Leah. You're not sure, you really love Rachel, your parents really love Leah, and they say, well, we want you to marry Leah. We want you to marry Leah. But if ever you've been put in that situation, or break off the engagement from this person. So here's the thing, your parents are items of mitzvah that you have to honor and respect, but not necessarily do whatever they say. There's no verse in the Torah that says, whatever your parents say, you need to do. We've already cut out where it says, they ask you to do a sin, you're not allowed to do. We're meant to be independent people. You're meant to be walking in front of your parents, living an independent life, making your own choices. The only thing to say is if your parents really felt strong that this person isn't someone good to marry, you should think about it. You should take it seriously. Because often your parents know you better than anyone else. Often your parents get you more than anyone else. Rabbi Tatsu always says the story that, that he always wanted to be a doctor and his dad said you'll be a much better teacher. So he tried to be a doctor and then now he's a good teacher. His dad got it right. You know, I always felt my son from a very young age, and if any of you know my son, would be the most amazing educator, the most amazing teacher, fantastic people's person. He's like the last thing I'm gonna be dad as a rabbi, forget it. You know, you're a rabbi, your dad was a rabbi, like I'm breaking the chain, like I'm gonna go into business, thank you. And he, and he, and he went and, and he, uh, he got an internship, and now he's a rabbi and a teacher. Right, because he's got it in him, the parent can see their qualities more than any it's funny like the child always says like you don't know me how many like these these teenagers like you don't know me anymore we know them so well we know them how but a child sometimes or an adult doesn't want to admit that the parents know them better themselves so we do have to take it seriously when our parents give us advice we should we don't have to necessarily it's not a command from god command from God is to honor them and respect them, but not to do whatever they say whenever they say it, to the extent where you can move countries if you need to, if that's the best thing for your spiritual life, for your business, for your relationship, you're allowed to move countries. You can still honor your parents from another country. What could be interesting is if there was a parent and there was no other siblings and you're the only one left and they're getting elderly, that's an interesting question which we need to ask a your own halakhic authority for. That's, that, that'll be a hard question. You know, it says when you have siblings, the siblings should be sharing the responsibility of, of looking after elderly parents. It should be shared. The finances should be shared. should all be shared. That is irrespective of how they treat you, how, how they are to you. But in terms of they say to you, we want you to do that job, we want you to marry that person, I'm if they ask you to, to do an errand, you know, I've got one of my students and he's always, his dad's always calling him up and saying, I need you to come around now and help me with this, and help me with this, and help me with this, and help me with this. So that I think you need to try and do as much as possible. Obviously there's a, there's, there's a level, right? Can't be like if the father's really taking the mitt, right? But, but if, if he's having the opportunity to do a mitzvah and, and, and look after his father's needs, what a great, what a beautiful mitzvah. 
You know, it's one of the only mitzvahs that promises you long life. Promises you long life. Laman yarichun yomecha. Do you know why? The Kabbalists explain, because it takes a lot of time. It's the hardest mitzvah in the Torah, the Talmud says, honoring your parents. To really do it, it's the hardest one. You think Shabbos is hard? You think on it because, because it's so counterintuitive. We want to be these independent beings with our own life, but yet we're being stepped back and being stepped back. And it takes time. It really takes hours and hours and days. And therefore, at the very least, I should just like, give you long life, I'll give you your time back. You know, you, you won't. I'll add on to the years that it took you to spend your own important time with your parents. I'll give you that extra time, even though the truth is, it's also referring to extra life in the next world. It's a famous story in condition. This is the place to really learn the, 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 the story about honoring your parents in the Talmud condition, page 30, next few pages of that. There's a two mitzvahs which promise long life. What's the other one? Anyone know? A bird. Sending what about the bird? Mother, sending a mother bird from the nest. Sending the mother bird away. You know, the one that you, you want to take an egg from a nest, you have to send the mother bird away. What's it called in Hebrew, Anton? Ah, see, you think you're there and you're not. Right, Shiluah Hakeim. It's called Shiluah Hakeim. So the mitzvah of Shiluah Hakeim is the two mitzvahs of which promise you long life. So the Talmud says the story where the father says, son, go up to the top of the ladder and shoo away the mother bird. And the boy climbed up the ladder, shooed the way the mother bore, then he fell off and died. There was one rabbi that lost it, that became a heretic because of that story. Because the Torah promises you long life, and you basically killed two birds with one stone, and the boy just died immediately. Makes no sense. He said, well, I don't know, where's the Torah? But then the Gemara said back, no, 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 come on. When the Torah says long life, it's really referring to real life, which is in the spiritual world, which is eternal life. It means it'll be a huge reward in the place which is long life, which is Olam Haba. So the truth is your world to come will be seriously improved and you'll be getting upgrades in your penthouses for those people who've done big mitzvahs of, of, of honoring their parents. Oh, I'll tell you an amazing thing. I've got this uh, guy in Golders Green. I'll give him a shout out. It's called Yossi Klein. I don't think he's watching. He's never watched anything before. Maybe after tonight he's going to tell me. Yossi Klein. Amazing soul. Why do I say about him? Because every morning I see him in Shacharis. And he goes, so for his first Shacharis, 7 o'clock in the morning, he dummies, and then comes to the 9.15 Shacharis with his dad, just to put filling on his dad. Every day. Every day. That means he's dummying twice. And Shacharis especially in the place that I go, it takes an hour. So he's spending two hours on chakras. And I appointed, I said to him, and I just, I'm just amazed every time I see him, you know, going to chakras again, just to look like, just to put on his dad, I said to him, like, I'm, I'm in awe. I couldn't have done that. And I, and, and I said, he goes, and he said to me straight away, do you think I'm going to let a carer put the tefillin on my dad? Do you think I'm going to let anyone else put the tefillin? For him, it was no big deal. For him, it was kind of a no-brainer. That's why some people are so special, so spiritual, that they're able to do it because for them there's no choice, which is, by the way, a very deep idea spiritually. You need to get to the point when you're doing beautiful, moral, spiritual things where there is no choice. Rabbi Dessa talks about this. When you have, when you're caught at a choice, should I do that? If any of you like, should I go to the rabbi tonight? Should I go to the shir or not? That's not a good level. The level you need to get to is, of course I'm going! May I chuz, 100% I'm there. There's an opportunity to learn Torah, I'm there! That's the way it needs to get to. A mitzvah comes, you need to, me'achos, of course. If it's like, mm. So for him, it was a no-brainer. That's the level. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. By the way, there's all these, nothing more in Judaism to be like making jokes about mother-in-laws. How's your mother-in-laws, everyone, right? And halacha is, you've got to honor them too. Mitzvah kibbutz of Amos and mother-in-laws as well. One of the reasons why Kabbalistically is a husband and wife are one soul. They're one. It's the male side of each other. So it's an extension of each other. So it's absolutely a mitzvah to, to honor them too. To honor them too. A few last stories. And then I'm happy to take questions. Any questions till now? Any questions? Yeah. Um, I 
I have heard the answer, but I can't remember what the answer is. But um, God sends Abraham away from his father in his, uh, in his old age. And his father's alive. And he sends him away. Hmm. Is that... Left on the outside. Huh? Left on the outside. <coughs> from your father's home. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes to grow, you need to... You need to um, move forward. Now, it's a little bit different there. His father was an idolater. And by the way, he died. So, so it wasn't that there was this battle of one of your parents versus not. It was more an expression of time to move forward and, and move away from some of the idolatry that you were brought up with. And, and we all have, in a, in a sense, an opportunity to, if there's been negative forces that we have learned at home, we have to be, move away from that. And I said you can't contradict your parents in front of them. You can live a different lifestyle if it wasn't a healthy lifestyle that they introduced you to. And part of growth, and this is paradox, is at times growing up and 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 changing and evolving and cutting down biblical cord and being independent, but at the same time having tremendous love and respect and appreciation of your parents. And it, it, it's funny how we achieve both. Yeah, you've been asked something? I just want to mention something because it really fits in very much with what you said. <coughs> the question was asked once. Why does the Torah not say, why do you not, why not honor your children? Why does it say, honor your parents? And one of the ideas that was given was, for us with children, it's natural that we love our children to bits, and we know it has to tell us to love our children. But funny, Hashem has to tell us to love our parents. Um, and it's almost counterintuitive um, from the one perspective. And the other perspective is if we are given that commandment to honor our parents and look after them, we're setting an example to our children and showing them what they have to do one day. And by the way, often the way we honor our parents is the way we're going to be honored or not. And, and, you know, what comes around goes around. <coughs> we finish off with a few last ideas. Beautiful story here. It was Rabbi Yeshua ben Elam was sleeping. He had a dream from Hashem, which connects us the next week, because next month we're going to still learn about dreams and have a list of books of dreams, what dreams are, as well. Just three dream interpreting of yours next week, next time. He had a dream. He said, be happy for you, and Namas the butcher is going to be your partner in Gan Eden. So this great rabbi, Rabbi Shobin Nivan, who is this Namas the butcher? Is that good news for me, bad news for me? He's my, like, my sharing a room with him in the next world. What's he like? So he's now, Rabbi Shobin, wants to go and find out who this Rabbi Namas the butcher is. So he goes to Namas the butcher, and, and the students go and try and summon Namas to come to the rabbi. And Namas like, yeah, really? He's just, he's just a very simple, secular butcher. Yeah, the rabbi wants to be sure. He, he couldn't believe it for a moment. And the end of Yeshua actually had to go to the butcher. And when he saw the rabbi, the rabbi come in the room, the butcher's my master. I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't believe this is true. Like, what do you want? So Yeshua said to him, What do you do? Like, apart from like, you know, butchering, what? Well, apparently, we're going to know each other in the next world. What are some of you? What's some? How do you honor your parents? So Nana said. I've got old parents, they can't stand, they can't get around on their own every day. I dress them, wash them, feed them. And I said, I get it. I said, you're very, very honored to meet me. Because someone who does that, who's really able to day in, day out, almost be a carer for their parents, it's incredibly high spiritual level. It means that they've now really achieved incredible things in the spiritual world. Next story. There's a great rabbi, one of my favorite Hasidic rabbis, called Ishvitzer. He wrote a book called Mea Shiluach. And there's a Talmud in Kedushan that says in 32b that this man called Abimi was once asked by his father to bring him a glass of water. I don't know if anyone's ever done this, right? So he goes to the dad, but the dad thought that's fell asleep. So Abimi, like Joshua with Moses, they didn't want to leave the, start, the mountain. He stayed by the mountain for 40 days. He felt, okay, I'm just going to stand there waiting for him to wake up. And at that time, Abimi's like, let me start doubling to Hashem. And he composed the Tehillim. We had the Tehillim club before. Tehillim number 79, one was composed by Abimi. It was composed while he was holding a glass of water for his father who was sleeping. Didn't want to leave. was waiting for his father to wake up. Says the Ishpitzer, why is that a Tehillim? What's so special about what he did? He explains that the moment Abimi realized that his father was sleeping, that he was still his father, deserving of respect and honor, 
even when a father is seemingly doing nothing for the son, he must still be honored. Likewise, I've been really starting to understand even when Hashem, I feel alone, I feel he's not helping me, I feel things aren't going my way, Hashem is seemingly sleeping, I'm still going to honor him, and I'm still going to love him. And that beautiful Tehillim of 79 is how what Abini said for Hashem whilst he was actually holding a glass for his father. There's another story in that Gemara, but I say the story of Doma ben Nasina. You know the story of Doma ben I'm sure my hands on there. You know? no? So Doma ben Nasina, I bet you do when I started it. The story of Doma ben Nasina is an amazing story. It makes no sense. He's there at home, a non-Jewish guy called Doma ben Nasina. He gets a knock on the door. Who are there? Some businessmen are out there. And they say, we, we have a business deal. We have 60,000 gold dinners. And all we need, we're happy to do the deal where we know your dad's a businessman, he's got some merchandise. If you give us the merchandise, we'll give you 60,000 gold dinners. You know what Dustin Menasino said? He said, Great, you can just wait a bit because my dad's sleeping. And the way he sleeps, he's sleeping and the merchandise under his feet, there's no way I'm waking him up. I'm not waking him up. Let's wait till he wakes up. He said, If you don't bring him now, we're going. Don Menasino said, I'm not waking him up. And they left. And a year later, Doma ben Nassim and his father had the merit of being born into their farm, a red heifer, a Pora Adumma. Which when they found out they had the red heifer, the rabbis came and said, we'll give you whatever you want, can we have the red heifer? And Doma ben Nassim said, actually last year I lost 60,000 gold dinners. 60, obviously it's come from God, for that mitzvah that I did, of not waking up my father, can I have 60,000 gold dinners for the Pora Adumma? Ask Rabbi Kaplan. It's a good question. Anton, what's your oldest kid's name? Madeline. Madeline. What would happen, Anton? You're sleeping, and there's a knock on your door, and, and, and Madeline opens the door, and someone outside saying, Listen, I'm a multi billionaire. I love your dad's car. Absolutely love it. Six million pounds. I'll give you the here and now if you give me the keys to the car now. And Madeline is like, you know, it's in my dad's sleeping and it's in his pocket and I don't want to wake him up. How would you feel <laughs> when you wake up and you just lost six million <laughs> for the car? You wouldn't be too happy. So so why was this such a great thing what he did? Good question, no? Who in their right man wouldn't want to be woken up for a great business deal? <coughs> Any other question? Any ideas what the answer could be? So the answer is that it depends who you are. If you're someone that doesn't value money, someone that, you know, Rebchaim Kanievsky doesn't care about the number one in our generation now is li living in a, in, a, in, a, in a hovel in B'nai Barak, and he has prime ministers coming to him. And he is not interested in materialism. He's in, he's in love like the Chobetz Chaim. He's in a different world. He so a, a child that knows the father doesn't value in any way materialism isn't going to wake up the parent for that. For us, we would want to be woken up. But that's, and the, parent, and the child would be wrong not to wake us up because that's what we want, which is really deep. Because to honor your parent, it depends who your parent is. You've got to give them what they want. You can't, can't give them what you want. You've got to give them what they want. Just finish off with one last story and then we'll call it a night. All right, my beautiful story. It happened in 1908. In 1908, there was a... Uh, married couple, Chai and Mushka and Avram, and they couldn't have kids. 16 years had gone by, they couldn't have kids. They were living in this another one-bedroom hovel with their father. The father of the husband was a very great sage. Maybe Anton's uh, heard, him with the text talks about the Leshem. Heard of the Leshem? One of the big Kabbalistic works. And, and, and the Leshem was living in the same kind of uh, apartment as the kids. But anyway, the kids couldn't have children after 16 years of being married, but they had this professor in Holland who was coming up with new ways to treat fertility. So they went on a huge long voyage to go to the professor. They were from the Ukraine and Lithuania. And, and they went to, they managed to get to Holland, they had the tests, and the professor said, Let's, we'll do the test, we'll do the research, we'll get back to you. We'll send a message back to you if you pass the test. And if you could be able to merit having kids. So now this, you 
and Kaya Mushka was saying to him all the way to, to, to Holland, saying to him all the way back, now waited week after week after week after week for the test results. Finally, the test results come in, and the test results come in, and unfortunately it says the words, really, really sorry to tell you that you failed the test, there's no way you're gonna be able to have kids, I can't help you. So this Chaim Mushka, who is now heartbroken, heartbroken, that her father-in-law was learning Torah in the room. She didn't want to break down and disturb his Torah, so she went outside. She went out, and she's crying. And it came to the evening time, and she was still broken. She didn't want to disturb the father-in-law. So now through the night, she's staying outside, crying her eyes out, heartbroken, but didn't want to disturb the father-in-law, the best <laughs> Certain point when the Leshem finished learning and put the lights off, she walks in and, and the father in law was still there and said, Where are you? Where are you? Where have you been? What just happened? At that time she said to him, I didn't want to disturb you, I didn't want to disturb you, Dad, you know, but, but we can't have kids. We just got a message that we can't have kids. The Leshem said, In the merit of how you honored me the merit that you allowed me to learn Torah, I give you a blessing that this time next year you're going to have a child that's going to light up the world in Torah. And a year later, she had a child, and that child was called Rebbe Yoshev, who I had the merit to meet a few times, who's one of the great leaders of our time. He lived for 102 years. And all because of the mother's tears that she didn't want to harm the father-in-law and she did the mitzvah of honoring your parents. So that mitzvah of honoring your parents gave the Jewish people the opportunity to have this beacon of light for Rabbi Yoshe that became one of the, the leaders of the Jewish world. So in the merit, please God, of us honoring our parents even a little bit better than we're doing now, Hashem should send us tremendous blessings and salvation <coughs> and we should all be honoring our parents and those of our parents who have left this world can be able to be resurrected soon. Sun Mashiach and the area of Amen. Amen.